Hi, I'm Jenna Flanagan, host of the WNET Group's multi-platform news magazine, Metro Focus. Now, Metro Focus features in-depth reporting, solutions-oriented reports from the community, and smart conversations, just the kind of conversation we'll be having here tonight. But before we begin, on behalf of American Masters and the WNET Group, I'd like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their generous support of Oliver Sacks' His Own Life and for underwriting the screening and our community outreach efforts. We'd also like to thank our production partner, HHMI Tangled Bank Studios, for their ongoing support of film, ITVS for its support of independent filmmakers, and all the donors and co-production partners for their support of Oliver Sacks, His Own Life, and the American Masters series. Now, this evening is presented by the WNET Group in collaboration with the 92nd Street Y, where Oliver Sacks himself appeared on stage numerous times. So it is my great pleasure to be here with all of you and joined by an extraordinary group of panelists. So without further ado, up first, we have Emmy Award-winning director, Rick Burns. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Jenna. It's great to be here. We're also joined tonight by executive director of the Oliver Sacks Foundation and Oliver Sacks's personal editor, Kate Edgar. Kate, welcome. We're also joined by renowned radio and television journalist and host emeritus of Public Radio's Radio Lab, Robert Krowich. Robert, welcome. And last but not least, we're also joined tonight by the director of the Spanish Language Neurology Clinic at University of Rochester Medical Center. Shout out to WXXI up in Rochester, Dr. Blanca Valdovinos. Blanca, welcome. Thank you, Jenna. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. So together we're going to explore the extraordinary life, enduring legacy of the legendary neurologist and storyteller, Oliver Sacks. We'll also ask as many, answer as many questions as some of you might have. So please make sure to type them in the OV chat. So first off, I'd like to start off with just the genesis of a documentary like this. It seems once you watch the whole thing, you get the sense that Oliver Sacks is someone who in an indirect way has touched so many of our lives without us fully realizing or recognizing it. So I'd wanna start with you, Rick, and just ask what was it about uh, this man and more importantly, his memoirs that you felt was worth bringing to a documentary to the small screen? You know, Jenna, you have the almost all of the unindicted co-conspirators to this project with you tonight, in particular, Kate Edgar, who um, I had met once before, um, but got a call from Kate in early January of 2015 to say that Oliver was dying and would we come in and film him? Um, and so without really any further ado than that, um, we, my colleagues and I packed up and a few weeks later had crowded into Oliver's flat um, on Horatio Street in Greenwich Village in New York City and uh, began to film him for what turned out to be that first session it was five days long, 12 hours a day, um, Monday, February 9th through Friday, February 13th in 2015. And I think that I was drawn to do it partly because I was asked to do it. But because Oliver, you know, I had never met Oliver before and he knew his work, uh, had read a lot of his work, certainly not all of it, and had formed the kind of strong impression that any reader of the New Yorker or the New York Review of Books or the London Review of Books gets when you would wait for Oliver Sacks pieces. Um, and had formed, of course, a sense of who he was, this kind of bushy bearded, um, infinitely empathetic, extraordinarily brilliant, um, dazzlingly gifted writer, doctor, uh, neurologist, um, and discovered that all that was true about Oliver, but there was just an enormous amount of that iceberg below the surface, which he was only at that point in his life, 81, about to begin to really consider and, and go public with his sexuality, his um, deep relationship with his family, very complicated relationship, especially with his mother, um, antagonistic relationship with basically every figure of authority he'd ever come in, and how difficult it was to be Oliver. 
um, for much of Oliver's life. Um, and so we got pulled in by who he was and then discovered here in this kind of final six months of his life, um, thanks to, to Kate, um, you know, what was going on there. Well, Kate, of course, as a co-conspirator, as Rick describes you, uh, you do appear in the film as we saw. And I'm wondering, you know, it's always so interesting with somebody, such a formidable figure. And by formidable, I do mean the work both in science and in literature that Oliver left us with, that at the same time, he also seems to be someone who wasn't necessarily comfortable immediately with telling his story and being on camera. And from your experience of the man, I'm wondering what, uh, are some of the things about his character that perhaps we still don't fully understand that you would have known having worked so closely with him? Well, as, as Rick says, you know, there, there was a lot submerged and, and I got to see a lot of that submerged self coming out and uh, trying to help Oliver get unstuck and get writing and, and that kind of thing. But um, he was able to be um, pretty honest with a, a close circle of friends, including Robert uh, Krolwich here and, and, and some others, but he was worried about going public. Um, I think for obvious reasons about his sexual orientation, because in that era, that was, that was a, an offense that people were jailed for in his country, in England, um, and worse. So uh, he was terribly shy and it, as Rick amazingly dug out and, and somehow intuited, he, uh, he had a very, very difficult childhood and that, that really marked him for his entire life. Well, Robert, I'd like to get, uh, bring you in and just sort of ask, you know, what is it about, um, just the way that from everything that we learned about the experiences that Oliver had, both good and bad, that how was it that from his perspective, at least, that you saw that shaping his ability to tell stories and not only that, but the kind of stories that he told because his work does have a very unique bend to it. I don't think you could run into anybody as deeply and originally and regularly and constantly a storyteller as, as Oliver was nothing that happened wouldn't he just sort of suck on and roll around and come roaring back with some version of it that just happened he'd get in an elevator and he would make some to do about the the dog on the elevator and i said gee i didn't know you like dogs i don't know anything i just i can only remember the dog's name not the woman's name and so i would laugh and then he would then add to that another story. And by the time we'd hit the sidewalk, we would be talking about bus stops and, and collisions with bus stops. He, uh, he was always full of, I think that literally the joy of watching and learning and talking about what he'd just seen. And at the same time, he had a formidable intelligence so that when he wasn't talking, he was listening really well or reading very deeply. And that's a funny combination to be with a kind of maniac who could walk into a gay bar and say, everybody come around and then show them out of some weird stereoscopic viewing machine from 1890, which they really weren't interested in. But he, and then kind of looking at me and thinking like, you know, catch this, like these guys are all here looking for dates and I'm gonna show them some 19th century, you know, technology. And so, that was fun, but then when he gets quiet, little gorgeous pieces of wisdom would just sort of flow from him. And so it was kind of a funny, kind of remarkable combination. In a friend, it was like being, it, it would be like, if storytellers were Greek warriors, like he would be like Agamemnon, <laughs> <laughs> one of the big guys. It was uh, crazy, really. Well, uh, Blanca or Dr. Valdo Valdovino, excuse me. Uh, I also wanted to get your perspective on just the fact that you have this incredibly empathetic, um, sort of outward looking, but inward thinking storyteller. What was it that at least from your understanding that that allowed him to bring to his practice? Because that's such a unique combination. Usually artists are just artists or writers and then scientists or doctors are just that. But here you have this one person embodying 
uh, both very well and very naturally. Yeah, so I think the incredible thing about Oliver is that he was a neurologist, he was a writer, he was a weightlifter, he rode his motorcycle up and down California. So I think he was very multifaceted, he was very human. I think um, early on, you know, his brother Michael was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and I think that definitely affected who he became as a person and who he became as a doctor as well. Um, in his autobiography, he mentions that, you know, when he left England, he left partly to get away from everything, but also to understand the mind and the brain in his own terms and way. And I think for me, um, when I was in college, I first came across the novel Awakenings. And for me, that was very, you know, touching. It did inspire me a lot. And I think the reason why I loved this novel so much is because he talks about patients that, you know, had encephalitis lethargica or sleeping sickness, which was an epidemic in the 1920s. And he starts taking care of them in the 1960s after they've had, you know, Parkinsonian symptoms for about 40 years. And he says in his novels that these patients were neglected by society, they were abandoned by their families. But then here he is taking care of them during the day, volunteering for the night shift so that he's there for his patients, just doing things that nobody else would do, you know? And at that time, he starts him on a medication, levodopa, which at that time was novel. You know, nowadays we prescribe it every day to patients. It's a common medication that we prescribe. And by doing this, they awaken from this state. You know, they're able to move now, able to walk now, um, do things of that nature. And I think what I love that, about that so much is that he saw his patients not only as patients, but as human beings. And he keeps saying that he always wanted his patients to be respected. He wanted to make sure that they had a sense of community, and that they weren't forgotten. You know, as Dr. Valdivino so beautifully put, uh, just going over the story of how it was that uh, Dr. Sachs was able to deal with these patients and to find unique ways of treating them. That, of course, played out in a very popular movie in the 90s, Awakening, starring uh, Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. Um, so, Rick, I want to go back to you and the sort of difference between that kind of uh, storytelling narrative and the documentary form, because, again, um, there's it was a beautiful story that was told, but of course, as we learn with so many Hollywood films, there's a lot that gets altered or perhaps shaped for the sake of storytelling. You know, I think that I have to say as a documentary filmmaker, which means you're a kind of a storyteller, you know, I found, I found Oliver, you know, his sensitivity to what the narrative of someone's life um, is, was really uncannily acute and that he really understood deeply and had the ability, you know, narrative is both specific and also universal and it generalizes and it creates, you know, an arc of experience. It doesn't go through every detail of experience. That's what the underlying research does or the experience itself. And Oliver's ability to um, kind of do the kind of nar summary narrative arc of someone's life and capture it, whether it was in a whole book or in, you know, chapters of a book like um, Man Who, Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, was really, really extraordinary. And I, I feel that he legitimized um, the idea and reality of narrative as a form of knowledge. He kind of underwrote the epistemology of narrative um, and gave it a credibility, which in some important sense, it really had not had in the 20th century. Story was associated with art, fiction, subjective experience. And Oliver was absolutely convinced that all those qualities had themselves such an, an amazing amount of information to convey about who someone was that couldn't be conveyed any other way. That was and that if you were going to, as, as Robert put it um, so beautifully in an interview he did for our film, that Oliver's mission was to story people who were very, very shut in back into the world. And in so doing, make their reality something that could be exchanged and understood across the barrier of, of interhuman subjectivity. It's kind of an amazing, amazing thing. And he came to it out of his own sense, I think of difference and strangeness, but I think he understood intrinsically that we're all different, we're all strange, and therefore all somewhat estranged from everyone else. And that he took it as a kind of, that was the point of departure. And if you happen to be really sort of rather spectacularly different as the case of the encephalitis lethargica patients, 
it meant you were no different in kind from anyone else. And so he was very un, um, daunted by the prospect of seeking to understand and storying back into awareness on other people's part, people with all sorts of gr often grievous and difficult afflictions. Robert, I saw that you were gonna add something. I just wanna check with you. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say how, how singular that was at the time, because what are doctors supposed to do? They're supposed to measure you and take your temperature and, 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 and get down statistics about you and basically see where you fit in in the common experience of people with your problem. So he's one of these, he's got three weeks to go, da, 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 whatever you do. And Oliver would say, who are you? And uh, let's find out about your mom and your dad. And let's hear the songs you sang. And these are not, you know, everyone knows that doctors don't normally ask you that. He was asking all of that for a purpose. And he would want to say that you know, he could, watching a, um, a, a Parkinsonian walk, try to figure out how to you know, unfreeze, <laughs> He could tell that person so many stories that it could fill page after page after page based on what he heard and what he imagined. And he would tell them a story about themselves. And they'd say, gee, Doc, you think? And said, well, let's give it. And, and the, just being heard and described turned out to be a kind of medicine. And he didn't get a whole lot of yay from the other doctors. At first, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, he, he also picked up a lot uh, that other doctors might miss. And there's a, there's a story he tells about when he was a medical student even, uh, and there was an old elderly tea planter who was in the hospital with terminal delirium. And everyone is just, oh, you know, don't listen to him. He's just ranting. It's, you know, it's his, it's his metabolism. And Oliver sat with this man hour after hour and began to be able to decipher some of his delirium and, and piece together the story of his life. Just an incredible thing for a medical student to do. Yeah. You know how long you have to sit there while someone goes blah, 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 exactly. blah, blah to make some sense of it? it? You have to listen and listen and listen. He was speaking something Finnish or something. I forget what it was, but he was speaking a real, he, there were real words in there. Well, I'm wondering if either one of you, especially considering that you had such personal relationships with Oliver, did you ever get the sense that he thought of himself as someone who was revolutionizing medicine? I mean, a lot of what you're both describing and what we see play out as he tells his story in the film is sort of what we, I guess, would now call maybe holistic medicine or something, treating the entire mind, body, and person, not just whatever ailment that they might be seeing a doctor for. And given that he started doing this in what, the late 60s, that would have been incredibly radical. Did he see himself as sort of a rule breaker? No, well, I, I think he was going backwards in time. I think he thought he was reviving something that had, had occurred earlier. That's right. He, uh, he really took his model from the 19th century neurologists who, who were the first neurologists who really kind of invented the specialty and they did so by giving long case histories of individual patients. Um, Oliver never thought of himself as a revolutionary sort. He just thought he was doing the right thing. And he, he often spoke about tact and delicacy. He, he really felt with every human relationship he had, and this was not only patients, but his dental hygienist or his postman or the milkman, whatever, he just connected with each of them in a special way. Again, I would say, I, I, just to give you one little snapshot. I sure. was at a birthday party for him. He had these big fancy birthday parties. But when you sat at the table, now just think about this. This is a Manhattan, a guy had been in Manhattan for 20, 25 years. At the table was his postman, his dental hygienist, the Nobel Prize winning chemist and his wife, me, my wife, and some guy who had stored gold bricks in his house for some reason. Okay, so it's a very, a very completely potpourri. Like there are some New Yorkers who wander through New York and there's some New Yorkers who gather and he gathered. There, there definitely, I would say there definitely are some New Yorkers who gathered. I've had the pleasure of getting to know a few of them. Um, <laughs> I do want to turn, bring you back to the conversation, Dr. Valdivinos, and ask roughly how long was it? Because as uh, Rich and Kate both mentioned that um, it took the medical community a little while to sort of understand and appreciate what it was that he was doing. So 
I'm just wondering from your perspective, would neurology be where it is now if you hadn't had uh, the perhaps retrograde work that he was doing? I'm not quite sure what the right word uh, that he would use, but without Oliver doing the kind of work that he did. So I think um, he has definitely contributed a lot. I think the fact that he really takes each patient and inspects them and really delves into each patient, not as a patient, but as a person, you know, like we've mentioned, just getting to know their background. In every case he describes, he just gives so much detail about, about his patients, you know, about their background, about what they liked. Um, and, you know, he talks about the power of music as well and things of that nature. And I think he does take a very holistic approach. Um, like I said, back then, in the 1960s, levodopa was very new. It was brand new. And he had a request approval, you know, to get to administer this medication to patients at that time. And I think the fact that he took that and, you know, saw his patients and said, I'm going to advocate for them, you know, and I think that's something that he always did is he advocated for them. And initially, he had given the medication to half of his patients and the other half had not received it. Um, and then when he realized the benefits of the medication, he decided to make it available to everybody. But I think the important thing about him is that he advocated for them and he, he's done things that other people are afraid to do. You know, I feel like as neurologists, we're always very comfortable. There are certain rules that we follow. And I think Oliver always did what was right to him. Of course. At what point though, specifically, and I want to give this uh, question credit because it is from WXXI in Rochester. Um, but at what point did the medical community start to embrace his work? Like, was there a particular case? Was there a moment? Was there a particular point for that? So I don't know exactly at what point. So what I do remember is that initially when he wrote Awakenings, there was silence from the medical community, right? So with uh, Awakenings specifically, initially the patients had responses, but then after a while, some patients had also side effects, right? So not a positive response from the, medica from the medication. So um, early on, the medical community wasn't very supportive. You know, he writes in his autobiography that he wasn't really seen as a real neurologist. You know, people didn't really, you know, see him as an equal in the neurology uh, world. Um, I would say in the 1980s, when he came out with more books as well and talked about more cases, um, I think that's when, you know, from my standpoint, you know, where I feel like the medical community embraced him more. Um, obviously, he's been embraced for many years now, but I think early on when he was doing, you know, the medication trials and trying something new in his patients, I think that's when you know, nobody else was doing at that time. So it was almost radical. And I feel like now um, we look back at what he did and we're like, that's incredible, you know, but I think it's kind of looking back at it. You know, one of the things that is always so interesting, particularly about uh, such a, again, multi-layered complicated individual like Oliver Sacks is the fact that he was, we learned through the film that he was such a shy and reserved individual and yet was so good at communicating and reaching out to people who, um, as we saw, essentially were trapped within themselves somehow, within their bodies. Uh, Kate and also Robert, I'm wondering specifically from your two points of view, again, from knowing him, did that make that a much easier connection for him to make the fact that he sort of lived within himself as well i'm guessing that made it possible for him to see what perhaps other doctors were missing and know to reach out to individuals um i think yeah, that that's such a that's an interesting question um you know i think he felt there, that his role as a doctor uh, enabled him or even required him to, to you know, be that communicating human being uh, to some degree. And I, so I'm contradicting what I just said about how he, he made that connection with everyone he came across. Um, but uh, he, he was um, very shy of authority as Rick mentioned of press, uh, it took him a long time to get used to, to uh, you know, being in the news or 
being reviewed or being on television. And even though he was a great sort of performer when he did lectures and so forth, um, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who have that contradictory sense of shyness and outgoingness. Uh, he later kind of, we all came to realize that part of it was that he couldn't recognize people's faces. And he wrote about that uh, in one of his books. He had a neurological condition which made him really bad at identifying individual faces. So he would remember, oh, she's the one with that dog or she's the one with the funny glasses or this is the guy who walks you know, a little bit differently. He was very good at observing those other characteristics. Well, Robert, okay. that fits right in with what you were saying about recognizing the dog in the elevator and not the dog owner. He, I mean, he had crazy, he went to, he went to lunch with a guy, famous artist, and they both had this problem. They both couldn't recognize faces. And one of them, I think it was Oliver, decides to go to the bathroom during lunch. <laughs> so he goes to the bathroom and he walks out of the men's room and he walks and he looks around and says, oh God, who was I having lunch with? I, I, I don't. <laughs> And the guy who he was having lunch with couldn't remember who he was. So this is a, so there's this one guy sitting at the table and, in, and the other one is wandering the restaurant. And though the two had been sitting next to each other, they couldn't relink. And that's a real, that would make anybody nervous, you know, if, if you had a situation like that. On the other hand, I would see him do what doctors do all the time, which is they put on the white coat. And when he puts on the white coat, then he has a role to play. Then he can listen to you and take your story and do a kind of doctorly performance that doctors do. And he was totally comfortable with that. But yes, there was a real gulf between what he could do in the right situation. Off a stage, oh no, I can't go on. Don't make me. Uh, on the stage, gorgeous. And wearing a pumpkin hat or something. I mean, <laughs> on Halloween, he would dress outrageously this is a man who would be so worried about everything when you had him alone. Like, I don't want to go there and get a brownie. I don't want him to say that thing to me. I don't know whether I have a dollar. I don't, I can cater to have this all the time, all the time about all of his crazy neuroses. But in performance, he was gorgeous. I guess there are people like that. I've never seen it quite so weirdly off, on, on, off as with him. But again, it was, again, he had these weird things. Like he, he not only could lose a face and didn't know who he was talking to, but he would like, you know, if he didn't go the usual route to wherever he normally went, he wouldn't know where he was. I mean, he was, he was almost lost a lot of the time and that would make anybody nervous, I think. It, it, I believe it would, but at the same time, the way you tell, retell these stories of him, uh, there's a almost Woody Allen-esque comedy to it, which- Yeah, um, <laughs> he would laugh at himself all the time. Like it was like, yeah, you were, he was the audience of himself all the time. <laughs> Uh, Rick, um, I want to come back to you and ask, you know, again, with uh, a character like that, that sometimes you hear about working with them can be a bit, I'll say, challenging. And that sometimes it involves, you know, wrangling the person, not just to get them to engage with you constantly, even though we've already heard that was something he did very well with his patients, but to keep the tangents from going too far. Or was that something that you were more than happy to capture? Because again, you have this incredibly rich tapestry of life in this story that you're going to be telling. You know, I, th I think that we were really happy to capture that because we were finding somebody in what was a version of his own natural habitat, his own living room, his own home. And to let Oliver simply be who he was. And if he was going to, he would sometimes before he read a passage from his as yet unpublished memoir, he would tell a story and then it would turn out to be the story he told was exactly what he was going to read. Um, and he would then interrupt himself to point out the fact that, you know, this was his, you know, 81st birthday and therefore this element from the periodical chart, he always had to have an element that matched the number of his birthday. So if it was 77, he would have an iridium element from the time he was 77 years old because iridium is 77 in the periodical chart. So at this point, you feel this sense of somebody kind of centrifugally wandering out into, you know, what sounds like an almost most mad degree of sort of associative self-expression, which is always completely gripping and grounding in some way, whether he was talking about uh, lemurs or moss or fungus or ferns at the botanical garden, there's a profound sense in which 
all of his interests kind of came together within, you know, the scope of this omnivorously wonderstruck personality as interested in who you were, as interested in how plants were, as interested in how this mineral tasted. And in that respect sort of did feel like a kind of like a, a sort of a natural scientist of the human condition who wanted to know as much as he possibly could. And he, in that respect, as a document, I felt, I don't think I've ever done a cinema verite film before. I'm a historical documentary, but in a certain way, Oliver was a version of cinema verite. We were the cinema, he was, <laughs> and we were just filming it. And most of the moments that I find most powerful in the time we, we were blessed to spend with Oliver and his colleagues like Kate and, and Robert, were just moments where the cap camera happened to capture a look on his face or a downward expression or a little laugh. Um, and you realize small pieces, sort of little sort of sparks of human truth were just sort of flying off the surface of this person. And if you were just quiet enough and still enough, the camera would catch it. Um, we're going to start our q and in just one moment, but I do have one last question. And that would be, uh, again, I keep going back to Robert and Kate, but you guys knew him so well. Uh, I think for a lot of young people today, the idea of being anxious or nervous about people finding out about your sexuality seems completely foreign to them. And so for that struggle, that inner turmoil that he had ever since uh, his mother found out and um, reacted the way she did and how he carried the guilt and shame and more importantly, the anger. How would you say, is there one particular way that you would point out and say that that really shaped his view on X or that really shaped his view on Y or did it, did that experience trickle into every aspect of his life, this holding on to the secret that again, young people today probably could not even fathom. Well, thankfully, young people in certain towns in this country can feel that way. Uh, other places still have a long way to go. Um, I think Oliver himself felt um, certainly all of those things. I mean, the man spent 50 years, five zero years in analysis with the same psychiatrist. Um, but he always felt that his sexuality um, as important as it was and as, as wounding as it was to not be able to reveal that to more people. Uh, it was really his early experience being separated from his parents at the age of six during the war, sent to a very abusive uh, boarding school, uh, which a lot of children at that time were sent out of London. Uh, but that, that was a very, very tough time for him. Um, and I, I always marveled that in spite of all of these things that he inherited from his childhood, he had this incredible sense of joy and wonder that just never stopped. I mean, even as you see in the film, with a terminal diagnosis, he was so passionate about telling the rest of us about his life and about the things that he loved. And he was just a man on a mission that point. I would say only that uh, when he fell, this guy Billy, towards the very end of his life, he fell hard. And it's funny to think of a person who was, you know, one of those people who was afraid he would be found out by his friends who all knew. I mean, he had two very close friends from childhood who were in a, in a gripping kind of boy, love, hate, jealousy, envy, compete totally great friends at the same time. And they were really tight and they both knew what he was, but he didn't want them to know or didn't know. And then when he finally fell in love and, uh, and it happened really fast, his big worry after that, he said, well, do you think that so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so would you know, be okay with it? I said, they know, they know. <laughs> so I don't know, there was a funny thing where he had to, he had to feel the power of love inside him, not outside, but inside him in order to, to sort of finally blossom. And what followed then, the magnificent death that he had, and the ease and the beauty with which he walked to 
to his annihilation is I think largely because he could finally be tell, tell the story of himself out loud to the world, first to his best friends and then to the world. And it was an extraordinary thing. There are comings out and then there's this. He comes out and then walks all the way to his destiny, powered to some degree by a love he wasn't able to express before. It was really nuts, really. Well, I would like to make sure that we leave time for our Q&A from the audience. And so, um, Dr. Valdivinos, I'm going to start with you. I have a question from a Jordan. Did his popularization of lesser known neurological conditions affect his relationship with his peers in the medical community? Um, do you <laughs> have an answer? Do you know? So I think, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, early on what he was doing was pretty radical, right? So just writing about um, patients, even now, you know, nowadays there's this, you know, privacy, HIPAA that we have to kind of comply with. And um, I personally think that the fact that he wrote about his patients the way he did, the way he took care of them, the way he listen to them because a lot of these patients, like I mentioned earlier, had been neglected um, by society, by family. So he wrote about these patients in so much detail um, that I personally, from my standpoint, I think it enhanced who he was as a neurologist. In the medical field, I understand early on, um, like I said, there was that, um, you know, people weren't really accepting him in the medical community. And uh, sometime later, he writes that, you um, somehow he, people started reaching out to him and, you know, saying, hey, this book you wrote was a masterpiece, you know, and um, people just started connecting with the patients and the stories he told. And I think something that's so important is that he always saw a person and it was like, you know, this, pa this person with schizophrenia or this person with autism, you know, he didn't, he separated, you know, the, the person from the diagnosis, you know, and I think as the medical community, you know, started realizing that and also realizing that he was seeing patients and diagnosing things that, you know, were rare. And he tells us that a lot of patients reach out to him for second opinions, thirds opinions, and he was the one that actually would diagnose them. So I think that in all, you know, from my standpoint right now, everybody in the medical community loves Oliver Sacks. Like everybody respects him and loves him. And I think that's, you know, what's the most important right now. Okay, all right. Um, Kate, we have another question for you. Uh, I guess getting into your origin story with Oliver, how did you get connected with him as uh, not just a friend, but also an editor? And of course, being in charge of his foundation. Yes, I, um, I, I met him, I, I was a young editor working in, in publishing in New York. Uh, and I was a, a kind of nerdy girl. And I used to get, you know, people would at the publishing house would say, here, this one's about science, you do it. Um, and, uh, and I was hired originally to, to really just type a part of his book, A Leg to Stand On, uh, which is a book that had given him, him a huge trouble writing. Uh, and he was in the final stretch of this book and I'm typing away. And the reason I had to type it was he had given it to his main editor who said, but Oliver, I haven't got a handwritten manuscript in 30 years. What is this? <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, you know, it was something he had written on his yellow pads uh, in his fountain pen, but it was also just splotchy, like he had dropped it in the bathtub. And I found out later that uh, what he liked to do would be to swim uh, on the weekends. He would go up to the Catskills and swim in a lake and have a little table by the side of the lake with his paper and when a thought came to him in the, in the water, he would rush out and, and write it down. So I, I began that way, kind of trying to channel his thoughts and, uh, and we just headed off well and things kind of snowballed from there. Rick, we have a question for you, or at least I'm directing to you. Uh, this question is from Don, and it's with so much material to cover, um, particularly when it comes to medical cases. How did you decide which ones to focus on? You know, <clears throat> film is a narrative medium. Um, and we had, it took us a while to understand how clearly we had two stories which were at the heart of this film. 
One was the story of a man born to Orthodox Jewish parents in North London in 1933. Um, Oliver Sachs, the youngest of four, both parents doctors. The other story was the last six months of that person's life. That's when Kate called us in. That's when Oliver said, I'd like to do some thinking on film. And so we had these two narratives, which the film was engaged in interrelating. The story told partly by Oliver Sacks and partly by an amazing group of people, 25 people who had known him well across the cor course of his life. And it was really bringing those two narratives into relationship because he's always there. He's always Oliver, 81 going on 82, dying of cancer. And he's looking back on his life and it's given to very few of us, it seems to me to late in life be inspired and have the courage to turn the glare, turn your, your look inward so deeply and so intensely. And then to do that when it's now not five minutes to midnight, but one minute to midnight because you've gotten a death sentence. And to be able to think and feel robustly on your feet as you confront that, as you confront, as Robert said, annihilation, was really quite remarkable. And the tension that we began to understand was at the core of the story was the whole life in relationship to coming to end of life circumstances. And his friend, Lawrence Weschler said really beautifully, he gave a master class in dying. Which sounds very grim, but wasn't grim at all. Most people who saw Oliver in the last three months of his life, Christoph Koch, a neuroscientist who we knew well, said, you know, I'd met I just left a dying man and I was in a wonderful mood. There was a feeling of jubilance and gratitude and not wallowing in self-pity. One might be sad or terrified, but at the same time, so full of energy and joy. And that was really, as I say, you know, you finish a film and you go, it, it, it sort of, if it hasn't died on the vine, it looks like it self-evidently should have been that way. It took us a long time to get there, but at the core of it, were those two narratives. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, another question that we have, uh, I will direct <laughs> to Robert, to you. Um, question from Basil. The question specifically is what aspect of his life um, did you discover that you would find to be the most shocking? But I would say what aspect of his life would you say would be the most, um, I don't wanna say shocking, but perhaps unexpected that people might not ever expect from this particular individual? Well, if you were really, really smart, and if you were um, really, really curious, uh, and if you were very, very talented in most of the things you did, it would be surprising, a little bit shocking to me to find out that this particular guy was thrown throughout his life into enormous spurts of remarkable energy and then periods of time where he could do nothing. Katie mentioned he was working very long on a book. I think it was like years and years. He was trying to, he fell down some mountain and had his, so learned a couple of things about his, the fact that he couldn't feel his leg and stuff. And this was a small little book he was writing and he just couldn't finish it. And there were other times when he would make a suggestion to someone, you know, I just looked at the title of your book and I want to make a few thoughts about it. And he'd write like 20,000 words to some poor hapless man. There was something about him that was uh, overdrive and underdrive. And it's funny in a famous person who seems kind of smooth and graceful in his public place, to realize that he was so erratic and so hard on himself and then so ferocious in his ambition and then so shy and then so on and then so off. And that peculiar, I didn't quite understand the necessity for it, he did have this shrink that he talked to for some reason for 50 years. You'd think the guy would have put a little bit of a, uh, a break on any of that, but to the end, including when he fell in love and including when he died, he did it all with a roar or a crazy silence, one or the other. When you meet that in a person, particularly if you know well, it's, it's, it's really queer in, in, the, in the old sense of queer. It's, just, it's something like, wow, why is, it, why is he like this? And I never got him... I would sometimes ask him, I think once with Rick, when we were, when he was doing the thing, I wandered in and said, let me ask you about that. And he didn't, he wouldn't give me nothing. <laughs> didn't tell me anything, <laughs> just wouldn't go there. I don't know, that's the thing. Maybe it's the mom, the terrible thing she said to him. Maybe it's the friends. I don't know what, I don't know what any of you guys think, but I never understood that. 
Well, does anybody else have any uh, really unique nuggets of, again, this incredible man um, that people would find surprising or shocking? You know, he was, at what I think, Robert, what you're saying is he was a person of extremes. Um, yeah. the, voice, the voice he developed in his writing was a voice that was very modulated and beautiful. And I don't want to say soothing, but it had a kind of a flow and a smoothness to it. And he was something that was surprised me when I stepped off the elevator on the eighth floor of the building he lived in um, and met him, was that he was much more extreme um, than one might have imagined. And everyone who knew him well knew that he had this quality of like tremendous shyness and tremendous exuberant self-disclosure of tremendous, you know, sort of patience and empathy and ferocious raging impatience and temperamentalness. And so he was a person who in some sense had a qualities of a child, which he kept right up until the day he died. And I think it was the source of things that some people might sometimes have found it exasperating or trying, but was the source of what people found deeply, deeply adorable and lovable about him. It was that quality that is kind of unquenching, unmitigated childlike quality that he had as a person. And Kate was right next to it the whole time. No one ever quite got enough, as much of it as Kate did. It's, Not it's true. Much. I mean, I used to say, you know, I had my, my biological child and then I had Oliver. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, because he, he was childlike, mostly in a wonderful way, but sometimes, sometimes he could be petulant or impatient or he, you know, if he got tired of company, you know, it was a long day or he was bored or whatever, he'd just leave, you know, he, they, they'd be in his home and he'd just like go into the bedroom and, you know, close the door. So he kind of had that uh, feeling um, of getting overwhelmed. Uh, I think that may be the flip side of his incredible openness to all sorts of stimulus coming in from the world, whether it was, you know, mental food, which he just consumed voraciously, or, you know, observations, just being in the world, listening to music, all of those things he just embraced wholeheartedly. You know, with that, uh, Dr. Valdivinos, we're almost at the end of our time, so I'm going to give you the final word on this. Uh, because Oliver Sacks was Dr. Oliver Sacks and a very famous neurologist, I'm wondering how do you view the mark or the influence that he left on the medical world? And if it's something that you see as pervasive or perhaps unique just to the field of neurology? I think it's something pervasive and I think it's something that he has inspired doctors, not just neurologists. I think um, the fact that he is so human and the fact that he just takes care of human beings, not patients, I think that is just so incredible. And I think he has left us with such a beautiful legacy through his books and now through this wonderful documentary. And I think, you know, I'm just, you know, so glad uh, to be part of this panel today. I just want to thank everybody, Rick and Kate and Robert and Jenna. Um, I think this has been a fantastic night for all of us. And like I said, I think we're all, you know, just speaking so highly of Oliver because we all admire him and work with them in different ways and different facets. So thank you all. Well, thank you all. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that we have come to the end of our time together. So uh, Blanca, Kate, Robert, Rick, thank you all for being here with us and sharing your incredible knowledge and, of course, your loving stories about the late Dr. Oliver Sacks. On behalf of the WNET group and the 92nd Street Y, I wanna thank you, our audience, for joining us tonight. So be sure to tune in to American Masters, Oliver Sacks, His Own Life, when it premieres on Friday, April 9th. Thank you and good night.